John Wayne Gacy, aka The Killer Clown. One of the most sadistic serial killers of all time. John Wayne Gacy was born on March 17th, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois. He was born into a blue-collar family and was the second oldest of three children. As his childhood went on, John was much closer to his mother and sisters, as his father was an abusive alcoholic. One of John's classmates had stated that the father would abuse John unprovoked. John felt as if he had to tread carefully around his father, walk on eggshells, and was desperate for his father's approval, but never succeeded in getting it. His father would just come out and belittle him and hit him. In 1949, his father found out that John had been fondling with another young girl and whipped him for punishment. Apparently that same year, John was molested often by a family friend, but never told his father as he didn't want to be blamed. John's father kept calling him a mama's boy and told him he would probably end up as a queer. John also suffered with a heart condition when he was younger, and so he couldn't really participate in many sporting activities. He also wasn't the smartest boy in the class, and so he didn't really excel in anything, and was pretty average, which led him to also suffer through some bullying. When he was in fourth grade, he had seizures and blackouts and had to be continually hospitalized when these happened. His father believed he was faking these seizures for attention. And although everybody else in the family believed them to be true, there is no actual record of him being diagnosed with anything. And in 1957, he had his appendix taken out. John later claimed that he thinks he spent at least a year of his life in hospital between the ages of 14 and 18 years old, and he blamed that for his lack of success at school. After he turned 18, his father eventually bought him a car, which he'd loaned to John until he could fully pay him back. But his father used this as leverage as the father would take away the car keys whenever they disagreed. In 1962, John made his own set of car keys, but his father just tried to destroy the car to stop John from using it. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, Chip. Do you believe that serial killers are born serial killers and that no matter what they do in life, they will always be a serial killer? Or do you think it is by nurture, so it, it is their childhood, I mean. I think it's a nurture. I think they're rewiring the brain with abuse. I mean, it, we, we've seen it so many times with these, with, with these serial killers, is their childhood is always messed up. Often, there's abusive parent involved, or some big traumatic event occurred to them yeah. as a child. And it set, sends them wayward. It so does. Down the dark, a horrible path. They're filled with rage. Anyways, you know, as a child, this poor child was abused by his dad, and um, that definitely plays a part in um, who he becomes later on. Mm. At one point, he traveled to Las Vegas and began working as an attendant at Palm Mortuary. He slept in the embalming room and worked there for three months. Later, he would confess that he had clambered into the coffin of a young teenage male and caressed the corpse. He freaked out called his family and returned home the next day. In 1964, he was working as a salesman and was engaged to Marilyn Myers, who was a co-worker, and they were married by September. Marilyn's father had bought three KFC restaurants in Iowa and John was supposed to manage the restaurants. So the couple moved to Marilyn's parents' former home and worked at the restaurant. In the basement of the house, John opened a club where his employees could go and have a drink. Here he tried to make sexual advances to young boys, but if they rejected him, he would cover up his advances by saying they were a joke or a morality test. In 1966, Marilyn and John had their first son and the following year, a daughter. At this point, John's dad came forward and apologized to John for all the pain he had caused by abusing him. After all the abuse mm. that John had suffered, his dad finally, well, you could say has the balls, but I'd argue that if you're abusing your own child to begin with, you don't really have balls. But you know what I'm saying? He's gone and he's apologized. And John probably has the feeling that he's won his father's approval. Mm. Did he come and apologize just because now, he's you know, doing John, well John's managing three KFCs. Yeah. It's probably regarded as pretty, he's doing pretty he's doing well. well for himself. And he's gone, oh, I want a bit of this KFC. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't actually know. Maybe the the, um, the motive behind it, maybe John's dad genuinely, genuinely felt yeah, bad, but yeah. I mean, who really cares? The guy was a total scumbag to begin with. It's gonna take a bit more than an apology 
for all the pain he had caused him through the abuse. So it, it must have been a weird feeling for um, John to hear that from his dad. But I mean, at the end of the day, it didn't, it didn't really change the course. I mean, it just, it just got worse from here. Now this video is in fact brought to you by the good people over at BetterHelp. If you're wondering what exactly that is, well, it is the largest therapy service out there. In your head, you might be thinking, therapy, I've got to go, I've got to see someone, you know, I've got to travel there. Well, this is all done online. And so what you do is you fill out a questionnaire and they'll help you match with the best therapist for you. You can go on there, you have these one-on-ones and it can be really good because ultimately life never comes with any sort of manual. Everyone goes through their That's own ups facts. and downs. I can promise you there will be a lot of your favorite YouTubers, celebrities, whoever they are, that are out there and they probably go to therapy. Even if it's something you think, oh, therapy should only be used if you know you have really big problems or whatever. It's honestly just nice to talk about things regardless and it's important that there's someone there that will listen to you, can help you out, give you advice, listen to you, all that good sort of stuff. So if this is something of interest, then check out betterhelp.com forward slash fellas mysteries. And that will get you 10% off of your first month at BetterHelp. So that's betterhelp.com forward slash fellas mysteries. Boom. Soon after, he began cheating on Marilyn with several prostitutes and started to hire young boys to work at KFC. His reasoning was that the younger boys were more likely to work harder. In 1967, John had sexually assaulted a 15-year-old boy, Donald Vores. He got Donald drunk and allowed him to watch porn. He then tried to convince Donald to perform sexual acts with him and said, quote, you have to have sex with a man before you start having sex with women. He abused several of the boys later and even told them that he was conducting homosexual experiments for scientific research and paid the boys up to $50. In 1968, Donald's father, Donald Sr., went and reported John to the police. John asked for a polygraph test and the conclusion was that John was nervous. John denied any wrongdoing and told everyone that it was politically motivated, as Donald didn't like him running for the Iowa JC president spot, as Donald was a Republican and John a Democrat. Many believed him, but at the end he was indicted in 1968 for sodomy charges. Before his trial, John paid one of his KFC workers to assault Donald Jr. to try and scare him from testifying in court. After conviction, he was confined in the Iowa State Men's Reformatory. Here he was forced to go through psychological evaluation. Two doctors had evaluated him over several days and they concluded he suffered from antisocial personality disorder, but was mentally stable for the trial. By the end of the trial, John had defended himself and the judge claimed that everything that happened with Donald Jr. was consensual. On December 3rd, 1968, he was found guilty and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. On the same day, Marilyn requested a divorce. In prison, he was the model prisoner and worked as a head chef there. His father died in 1969 and John was distraught. He was released in 1970 on parole with 12 months of probation, meaning he had to go back to living with his mother and had a 10 p.m. curfew, but he was more than happy to do this. However, in 1971, he was arrested again for another sexual assault, a case which was later dropped as a boy never appeared in court. Now with the first person, John actually paid a bit of money to try and scare off that fella from testifying. Uh, or coming forward, but then in this other one, the one in 19, uh, 1971, when he was uh, arrested again, yeah. the boy never appeared in court. Could have Do been the you, same thing? Same vibe, maybe he was intimidated, he, he was intimidated by someone, there was, you know, he, he had threatened if you do come forward and you mm. do go ahead with this case, then, you, you know, I'll kill you, whatever it could have been, there was some threats. I mean, so, some people just straight up are just uh, intimidated by going to court and the whole process can be very scary, very so stressful, maybe it was yeah. that, but I mean, just looking at his track record, I would be willing to bet that there was some sort of intimidation involved. Yeah, I mean, he's done it once, there's nothing going to stop him from doing it again. Yeah. Pays a KFC worker a little 50 dollars, go beat the crap out of this kid. Yeah. Shortly after he became a chef and bought a house in suburban Chicago. His mother lived in the house with him, but they were both very happy to do so. In August 1971, he started dating a woman he knew from high school called Carol, who had two young daughters. Soon after, they announced her engagement and his mother moved out. He decided to quit being a chef and started his own construction company. And again, he would hire young boys. He sexually assaulted one of the young boys on a business trip in Florida. Once back in Chicago, the boy came back to beat him up. 
Other than that, John got on really well with his neighborhood. He had a good reputation and even amongst the police. He also got a membership to one of the local clubs, which is where he first heard of the voluntary Jolly Joker Clown Club. He then started to dress up as a clown and perform at birthday parties, charities, and many more events. His stage name was Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. By this time, John was bringing young boys to his house and taking them into his garage. In 1972, John would pick up his first murder victim, 16-year-old Timothy from a bus terminal, and told him he could crash the night at John's house. He took the boy back to his house and the next morning, John was woken with Timothy pointing a knife at him. John leapt up and killed Timothy. It turned out that Timothy had prepared breakfast for John and came in to wake him up, and John misread the situation and killed the boy. He buried his first body under his house in the crawl space. In January 1974, he murdered his second unidentified victim and buried him in the backyard of his house. A year later, one of John's young employees injured his foot and so had to stay home. John went to 15-year-old Anthony's house and attacked him. He tried to cuff his hands behind his back, but Anthony was a high school wrestler and so fought back. John said if they both calmed down, he would uncuff Anthony and they should forget the whole thing. Anthony agreed and John left. So this is really where the whole clown, the killer clown, I don't want to call it a brand, right? But like his, this whole thing came about mm. was because he started doing these jobs and going to part. I mean, this is for a guy that likes young boys, young men, whatever it is. Perfect job is for it, him. Yeah, I yeah. mean, he's, this is it's so ideal for him. He's getting to meet them all. But then also, do you think that this is where he got, I guess you could call it his MO, about handcuffing the people into submission? Mm. Was it, did he get that from prison? What he would do is he would do a magic trick of him getting out of the, the handcuffs and then he would ask the other person to try it themselves. See if they could do it. Then boom, once yeah. you know you've just been handcuffed by John Wayne Gacy and you're in trouble. You, you're, in, so you're in a bad way at this point. So is this something that he's picked up from prison? Was there a certain feeling in prison when he was handcuffed and he was there like, I want other people to feel the pain that I felt. But at the same time, he was actually yeah. relatively good in prison. Like he wasn't, you got the vibe that he, he, he was okay with being in prison. So... I don't know. Maybe he got it from there. Maybe it was just a, a sick trick that yeah. he decided. Well, I mean, it really does make it a lot easier for him to assault his victims with the handcuffs. So yeah. maybe it was just his way of making that part of the job a lot easier instead of having to batter them or, you know, yeah. once people got their hands tied behind the back, they're pretty much, you're pretty much done. Yeah. yeah. The same year, another young boy, 18 year old John Bukovic, disappeared. Prior to his disappearance, John Gacy and Bukovic were seen having an argument about unpaid salary. John lured the boy back to his house and strangled him to death. He planned to bury Bukovic's body in the crawl space, but his wife and stepchildren ended up coming home earlier than planned, and so he quickly buried the body under the floor in the garage. John was questioned regarding Bukovic's disappearance, as he was his boss, and he admitted to have seen Bukovic early on in the day and admitted to the police that they had an argument about salary, but then he didn't see him again. Even though Bukovic's parents were very suspicious of John and believed him, to be involved. John and the father searched for Bukovic together. In 1976, John and his wife finally decided to get divorced. And according to John, the years following the divorce were his cruising years, where he committed most of his murders. Although still popular within the neighborhood, many noticed his slight behavioral change after the divorce. They saw him hanging out with more boys, as well as noticing his car arriving and departing at strange hours. Now he's divorced. I mean, he calls them the cruising years. I mean, that's a very nice way to put his most fucked up time. Time, yeah, where things just get completely out of control. The amount of victims from this point onwards is just obscene. It's almost as if he got a bit of a taste for it, like the power, like like the feeling of it. He then gets divorced. He, it could have been maybe a, a reaction set off in him. Maybe there's more anger. He's divorced. He feels like his family's gone now. What does he have to live for? I'm just going to keep doing this and I'm going to ramp it up. Yeah, the chains are off. Yeah. He can do whatever he wants now. It feels like it. And he is getting away with so much as well. It's just mental the amount of victims there ended up being. During his cruising years, he abducted, murdered, and buried many more boys under his house. Daryl Sampson, Randall Refett, Samuel Stapleton, Michael Bonin, William Carroll, Kenneth Parker, Michael Marino, and William Bunn. 18 year old David Cram started to work for John and somehow ended up moving into John's house. John tried to trick him into putting on handcuffs, but David had been in the army and so fought John until he was freed. 
but still decided to remain living in John's house. A month later, John tried again, but David fought back again and finally decided to move out. Once David moved out, Michael Rossi moved into the house and assisted John when he needed a partner in his clown gigs. Later in that year, 17-year-old Gregory Godzik disappeared. His parents contacted John to ask him about the disappearance, and John claimed that Gregory had left him a voicemail, which was accidentally deleted, where he told John he was running away. A month later, in January 1977, 19-year-old John Schick also disappeared and was buried in the crawl space on top of his first murder victim. John managed to lure Schick under the pretenses that he wanted to buy his car. After the murder, John sold the car to Michael Rossi for three months later. Two months later, he also killed 20-year-old John Prestige. Next was 19-year-old Matthew Bowman. In August 1977, Michael Rossi was arrested for stealing gasoline. But when the police brought him in, they were more interested in how Michael managed to possess John Schick's car. He then told the police that he brought the car from a man named John Wayne Gacy. And John explained to the police that Schick wanted to run away, and so he bought the car to give Schick money to survive. By the end of 1977, six more young boys were murdered by John. Robert Gilroy, John Mowery, Russell Nelson, Robert Winch, Tommy Bowling, and David Talsma. Finally, 19-year-old Robert Donnelly was abducted, raped, tortured, and his head was repeatedly dunked into the bathtub until he passed out. After several hours of torture, he released Donnelly back to his workplace and told him that he shouldn't go to the police. And if he did, they wouldn't believe him. In January 1978, Donnelly didn't listen to John and decided to go to the police. They questioned John and he admitted that he had a quote, sex slave relationship, but everything else they did was consensual. And so the police decided to let him go. John then went on to kill 19-year-old William Kindred, and he was the last body to be buried in John's crawl space. I mean, my brain is struggling to just comprehend the, um, the amount of people here that have been buried inside his house. I've got so many questions here. Even if you're burying them under your house, there has to be a stench. There has to be a smell. You've got so many bodies buried underground. Do you not think that surely there would be a weird smell? I think there was a weird smell. I, there has to be. There has to have been a weird smell. Like you, we'd seen with Jeffrey Dahmer in his apartment and how yeah. that smell was seeping through into the neighbor's apartment. Yeah. People coming into this house, it's a crawl space, right? So it's not a basement. It's just like the space yeah. underneath the house and they're all buried. There's Mate, it's grim. There had to have been a stench. 30 bodies buried under there. Yeah, it must have stunk. He actually confessed to the police and said, he, the reason why he didn't put the bodies in the attic was because he was worried about the leakage. And we've spoken about that before, mm -hmm. is that's a very common thing, you know, like you, you end up getting very visible, clear leakage. And it was actually, if you guys uh, took a look at our MI6 case, it was one of the reasons why we think it was definitely a professional hit, was because they put him in a bathtub. And obviously, if you put someone in a bathtub, you're not going to get that leakage. That was smart. Because so, it's got its own plumbing. Yeah, so, so But the thing is, you can't put 20 to 30 bodies in one bathtub. It doesn't work. So you can understand why he's gone for it the way he has. I just still don't really understand how it just didn't absolutely stink did, yeah, up, did even he, out onto the street. Like, surely at one point, he must have thought that this is temporary. They have to go somewhere. Yeah. Maybe the river. I don't know. It didn't. <laughs> they just stayed there. John then managed to abduct 26-year-old Jeffrey Rignall into his car. He drugged him, drove him home, and hung him from the ceiling. He raped him and tortured him with tools, including lit candles, whips, and drugs. After he was satisfied, he drove and dropped him off at Lincoln Park in Chicago. Jeffrey found his way home and reported it to the police, but they didn't investigate further. As he was drugged, it was hard for him to remember exact details, but he remembered enough for the police to obtain an arrest warrant for John Gacy. And so he was arrested on July 15th and was on trial for battery against Jeffrey. By 1978, there was no more space for bodies in the crawl space. And so John started to throw his victims off the Interstate 55 bridge into the Des Plaines River. He confessed to having thrown off five, but only four were ever found. The turning point in the case was 15-year-old Robert Peast. In December 1978, John Wayne Gacy came into a Nissan pharmacy to try and discuss a remodeling deal with the owner. He placed himself within earshot of Robert and told the store owner that he was hiring part-time young boys for $5 per hour, which was nearly double the salary at the pharmacy. Robert's mum was waiting outside of the store to drive Robert home, but Robert told her to wait for a couple of minutes as there was a contractor who wanted to talk to him about a job. He said he would be back very shortly and left the shop at 9 p.m. By 10 p.m., he was murdered. Very shortly after, Robert Peace was reported missing. 
When the police found out that John was the last person to see him alive, the police officers did a background check on John and found that he had an outstanding battery charge against him in Chicago and that he had been in prison for the sodomy of a 15 year old boy. They quickly obtained a warrant and went to his house. They asked him to come down to the station to be questioned and he said he would come later in the evening as his uncle had just died and he had to do some admin. When the police pressed him on how fast he could be there, he said, quote, You guys are very rude. Don't you have any respect for the dead? He then arrived at 3.20 a.m. covered in mud, claiming he was in a car accident. He denied any involvement in the disappearance and claimed he had returned to the store as a store owner had called him and told him that he had left his appointment book. This was all denied by the store owner. The detectives asked John to write a detailed statement about his movements on December 11th. The police obtained a warrant to search John's house and found police badges, pistols, a syringe, handcuffs, a dildo, drugs, several driver's licenses, and books on sexuality and pederasty. The police had confiscated John's cars and two-man surveillance were put on him for 24 hours a day. As the news that came from this, Michael Rossi, the guy who used to live with John, called the police and told them about Gregory Godzik's and Charles Hatula's disappearances. Then everything started unraveling. The police found out that the battery charge was a complaint put forward by Jeffrey Rignall. The same day, a ring found in John's house was linked to John Schick. David Cram, who also previously lived with John, told the police that John was hardworking and had an open-minded attitude to sex between men but also told them that John had given David a watch, which he said he got from a dead person. This is pretty crazy. At this point, the police are hot on his tail. Mm. For some reason, John just has this level of arrogance. In his head, he's thinking they're just not gonna arrest him on anything trivial. So he even started like speeding. He's doing just all this crazy stuff. I don't really understand how they find like a ring in John's house um, that was linked to one of the victims. Uh, David Cram uh, previously told the police that John was working, uh, was hardworking and had an open mind attitude to sex between men. I mean, there was a lot of things here that should have really pointed towards him. I just find it a little bit, not annoying, but they took a while to get this guy. I'm surprised as well. Like, if you, like, John Wayne Gacy, he's got the police in his house, searching his house. They find all this stuff, like police badges, yeah. books, images, handcuffs, like, the books on sexuality and pedestrian, yeah, whatever, yeah, however yeah. you say that. That is enough to be like, okay, this guy's dodgy. Then he thinks he's going to get away with it, even though the police are there and the bodies are right under them. Surely he knows they're going to be back. John even has this famous saying, which was clowns can get away with murder and he was literally saying this to the police that he was you know at the restaurant with and it is uh it's disturbing i bet he thought he was that guy after he dropped that one in there. <laughs> yeah cold on, on the way home in a car yeah that's me exactly on december 20th john went to visit his lawyers probably to discuss the civil trial he was facing on this visit he started drinking and pointed to an article on a newspaper an article about robert priest and told his lawyer quote this boy is dead. He's dead. He's in a river. He then confessed everything to his lawyers and told them that he had murdered at least 30 victims and most of them were buried in the crawl space and another five in the river. Since he was drunk, he fell asleep halfway through this confession and denied confessing anything the next morning. His lawyer booked a psychiatric appointment for 9 a.m. but John dismissed the idea and said he was busy with other things. He then drove to his friend's house, Ronald Road, and confessed to him saying, quote, I've been a bad boy. I killed 30 people, give or take a few. He then went back to meet David Cram and Michael Rossi. After John left them, David called the police and told him that he had just confessed to murdering 30 people. John knew he was about to be caught and so drove to his father's grave and spent some time there. On December 21st, a search warrant for his house was approved and so the police went. John Wayne Gacy wasn't there, but he had unplugged his sump pump, which flooded the crawl space with water to make it harder for the police to find the evidence. The police started to look and found an arm bone, and then more. The following day, John decided to go and help the police find the bodies in the house, as well as pointing out where in the river he threw the other five bodies. By the end, they found the bodies of 29 boys within the vicinity of the house, and four more near the close by river. Many police officers were traumatized after digging through the house. John Wayne Gacy's trial started on February 6, 1980 and was charged with the murders of 33 boys. His team claimed he was insane and so argued he was not guilty. This led to many psychologists, doctors, everyone to evaluate him and see if he was mentally stable enough to stand trial. The jury deliberated for two hours and concluded that John should be sentenced to death and so they chose to execute him by lethal injection on June 2nd, 1980. 
The victim's families were happy with the outcome, but John kept saying that he was the victim and still pleading innocence. Whilst in jail, John tried to appease the sentence many times, but failed. He also picked up art and painted a lot of clown paintings. His final meal was a bucket of KFC chicken, fries, fried shrimp, diet coke, and strawberries. His last words were, quote, kiss my ass, and he died on May 10th, 1994 at 1258. There are some rumors that he must have had an accomplice, as he couldn't have committed all the murders himself, but no one was ever found. His sister was very confused as she still loved him, but she hated him for everything he had done and couldn't forgive him. She publicly spoke about her confusion and after his death, she tried to do an autopsy on his brain to understand what was wrong with him. I mean, this case is just mind boggling. I, I mean, the fact that there was genuinely 33 deaths here, 33 victims, I, I'm not really too sure how it went on for this long. Obviously he was doing his thing, but guys, we've got 33 people missing here. I don't know, I just feel like they should have caught him a lot earlier. Yeah, they really should have. It was, it was a fumble. They've uh, let 33 uh, people die. I do feel like there were some people I don't know if it's friends or anyone that would have knew someone and haven't said anything. Yeah, they, they have, have to hundred percent. Yeah, I don't think I. I agree. I. Th I don't. They, they were talking about whether this was a one-man job, and I think he probably did do like most of this. But there was definitely some people just helping him out in bits and pieces. Maybe if they didn't know to the full extent of what was happening to these boys, they they had to have known more than what they were letting on. What I do think is quite uh, almost like a full circle moment, maybe, or like the moment where you, it, I, for me it linked back to the beginning was when it goes back and his last meal was KFC chicken. And it's like, you know, that was when his dad apologized to him and said, sorry, I don't know. I just feel like it ties back to, to those times. Man's legacy is, is, is that KFC. Yeah, yeah. And his last words were kiss my ass, which yeah. I don't want to say is badass or like epic or anything, because we're talking about one of the most twisted people of all time, but Fair enough. So guys, that's gonna wrap this one up. I'd love to know your thoughts on the killer clown. Chip, tell them what they need to do. Uh, make sure you subscribe, go follow us on Spotify, leave us a five star rating, a like on this YouTube video, and we'll be back next Monday, 6 p.m. with a brand new case. <laughs>